Guatevisión presenta. Muy buenas noches, queridos amigos, y bienvenidos a un show con Tuti. Gracias por su sintonía, gracias por estar siempre pendientes de nuestros programas. Hoy vamos a aprender mucho sobre todos los papás y los que nos estamos encaminando también a ser padres. Ojalá y les sirva, porque estaremos hablando sobre la nutrición infantil desde diferentes puntos de vista. Nos acompañan expertos que nos van a sacar de todas esas dudas que como padres a veces no sabemos cómo resolver a la hora de nutrir bien a nuestros pequeños. Amigas, amigos, bienvenidos. Y es que decidimos abordar este tema, nutrición infantil, porque lo podemos ver desde diferentes perspectivas realmente. Para muchos padres, no es ningún secreto, nos angustia muchísimo cuando vemos que nuestros hijos no comieron todo lo que les pusimos en el plato o están comiendo de más o en un tiempo de comida mmm, no quisieron probar alimento. No digamos y nos trasladamos al otro ámbito que, pas que pasa en nuestro país que es la desnutrición infantil. Todo esto lo vamos a ir tocando poco a poco a lo largo de este programa. Y es que nos acompaña una experta, ella es psiquiatra pediátrica, pero además está especializada en alimentación infantil. Eh, ha escrito libros alrededor de este tema, de cuando los hijos no comen o comen demasiado y cómo tratar todo esto también desde el área psicológica y nutricional. Es un gusto para mí presentarles a ustedes a la doctora Irene Chator. Bienvenida a Guatemala, doctora. ¿Cómo está? Thank you so much. I enjoy being here. Me da mucho gusto que esté por aquí, ya se nos van unos días, así que quisimos aprovecharla al máximo. ¿Por qué enfocarse, doctora, en la especialización de la alimentación de los niños? ¿Qué le llamó la atención de esto? You know, I uh, actually started out treating adolescents with eating disorders and I was the director of the consult service and I realized uh, that there were young children who had feeding difficulties. And there was very little awareness and very little knowledge in understanding the feeding difficulties in this young population. And I thought there are quite a few specialists for eating disorders in older children and in adolescents and adults. So I decided that was an area I wanted to learn more about and I started to do research in this area. El problema también creo yo, doctora, cuando hablamos de mm, niños y adolescentes es que la, la atención generalmente se ha ido a los adolescentes, a la anorexia, a la bulimia, y no ponemos atención a los pequeños, porque si los vemos, eh, no sé, con más cuerpecito o rosaditos o cachetones, creemos que están sanos y le decimos, ¿no? Yes. Qué bien se ve el niño y no precisamente está bien nutrido, ¿cierto? No. No, not necessarily. Some children with serious feeding difficulties are normal weight. Some become underweight. Uh, and it depends whatever the feeding difficulty is. But I think what many people don't realize is you lay the foundation for later functioning in the first three years of life. En los primeros tres. Yes. Yeah. First three years. That's when the brain is in very rapid development. And there is a process that is called pruning of the brain. And it's like pruning a tree. When you have a tree with fruit, the branches that bear fruit you keep, the ones that are not bearing, they are pruned off, they are cut off. Mm -hmm. Something similar happens in the brain. The kind of uh, functions that are taking place, uh, whatever way the child behaves, those pathways in the brain They grow and they get bigger. And what is not used is going away. So it's a very important uh, what happens in the first three years of life. And it's amazing what a difference one can make in treating young children. It takes so much less time and it has such a bigger effect. So that's why I wrote the book, uh, because I wanted parents to understand that this is such an important critical period and they should make the best of it. 
Esta es justo la edad en donde nos estresamos más como papás, que no logramos a veces que ellos logren comer, que, que ellos logren, eh, bueno, según nuestros parámetros, que esto también lo vamos a hablar más adelante, que no siempre son los adecuados. Eh, ¿Es cierto que en, esta edad, en estas edades, justamente en los primeros años, es cuando ellos aprenden a conocer su punto de saciedad, doctora? Sí, es cuando deberían aprender. And I think many parents often have a wrong understanding of how much a child should eat. Sí. Uh, but what I hope I can help parents with is to teach the child self-regulation. Mm -hmm. And uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Alan Satter, she had a very simple rule of thumb. She said there are three things parents should do. Mm -hmm. They should decide where, when, and what they feed the child. Okay. And the child should be allowed to decide how much he or she wants to eat. De verdad. Eso es algo que jamás se nos hubiera dicho a ninguno. Es, póngale usted a su hijo y hasta que no se termine el plato, no deje que se levante de la mesa. Eso es un error entonces. Yeah. That's, that's a wrong, wrong approach. Okay. And it leads to real difficulties uh, for the child to learn to self-regulate. Uh, because you tell the child how much to eat, and it's not what the child's real needs are. Mm -hmm. So what I uh, suggest to parents is that they should feed the child four times a day. Okay. Breakfast, lunch, a mid-afternoon snack meal, and dinner. And these should be meals at the table, sitting down, Not on the run, not in the car. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, no, no frente a la televisión. <laughs> uh, yes, not in front of the TV. Yes. And uh, the, the parents should expect the child to sit for about 20 to 30 minutes. It shouldn't go any longer. And I have so many parents who tell me they feed up to an hour. Every bite is a struggle. Sí. But if you feed the children at these set times, And there is no feeding in between, no milk, no juice, no little snack, just water. And you will be surprised how children learn to recognize when they're hungry. And if you keep them on the, at the table and ask them to stay there until mommy's and daddy's tummies are full, they learn to eat until they're full. And the body is just set up in such a wonderful way that uh, you don't need to decide for the child. Tenemos que aprender a confiar entonces en nuestra pulguita de dos y tres años a que nos diga Absolute, esto es suficiente. Absolutely. Yes. Estoy impresionada. <laughs> and, and, and you know, so children, uh, sometimes, especially young children, they don't eat the same amount all the time, es so cierto. they have better days, they have better meals, and they have not so good meals, and that's okay. Their activity level is different, and uh, their physiology might be different. So parents should accept that sometimes they eat a little. Nos queda un minuto, the pero quiero preguntarle, eh, doctora, ¿qué hay con las diferentes comidas? Porque muchos papás dicen, yo le doy brócoli, su pollito, su arroz, pero no le gusta el brócoli, pero no le gusta el pollo cocido, pero el arroz no le gustan los ejotes que tiene el arroz, ¿no? Eh, yes. Y entonces dice, como no come esto, bueno, pues ahí va el puré de papas de más, o ahí va el, el snack de bolsita, y entonces cometemos ese error de como no comió lo que yo le di, le doy algo extra para que coma algo. ¿Cómo hacer que el niño coma esa comida que sí es saludable y nutritiva? Yeah. You know, it, it's important to understand that there are children who are selective. Mm -hmm. And there are two reasons why children are selective. There is the child who realizes, if I don't eat that, mommy gets up, she gets me something else and something else. And so they become very choosy and very selective uh, in order to have control. Claro, gracias and, a la mamá and, que and, <laughs> and the young child loves to have control of mommy and daddy, right? And before you know, you're a short order cook and you dance to the music that your child makes. So that's the, the one the problem. But there are children who have what I have described as sensory food aversions. Mm -hmm. That means that certain foods trigger very aversive reactions. And it can be the taste, it can be the texture, it can be the smell or the temperature of the food. ¿Y debemos respetar esta aversión a la comida? 
you know, what happens is uh, when you feed them a food that is aversive, uh, they grimace if it is mild. They spit out the food if it's more severe, and they might gag or might even vomit mm -hmm. uh, because the food is so aversive uh, to the child. And there is a genetic predisposition for this. It runs in families. And whenever I see children with this selectivity because of their sensitive food aversions, and I ask the parents, one or the other parent, or an uncle or an aunt or a grandparent, was a picky eater. And they kind of forget that it starts early on in life. And it's very important for parents to observe their children. And when they have these aversive reactions, if it is mild, if it is grimacing, they might overcome it. But if it is severe and the child spits out the food or gags and vomits, they should not offer that food anymore. Wow. Because it only scares the children more. Y esto seguramente repercutirá en un futuro y puede también eh, producir algo más en, 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 en años. Vamos a hacer la primera pausa comercial. Gracias por estar con nosotros. Mire todo lo que aprendemos a 100 minutitos, además. Hacemos la primera ca pausa comercial. Hoy estamos hablando sobre nutrición infantil. Nos acompaña la doctora Irene Chator, que, quien es alemana, pero ha vivido mucho tiempo en Estados Unidos y ha desarrollado muchísimo este tema de la alimentación infantil. Vamos a hablar con otros expertos que también nos acompañarán y muchos más hoy en nuestro programa.